Welcome everyone to our webinar on building a successful sales strategy for 2024. While we wait for folks to join the webinar, why don't you uh, enter into the chat? Let us know who you are, give us your name, where you're from. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, engage with you. This webinar will be recorded. And so you will receive a copy of this um, later this week. And again, let us know where you're from. Would love to hear from you. We're gonna be talking about building a successful sales strategy for 2024. And uh, you know, it's kind of hard to believe we're officially in the fourth quarter. Um, the year is winding to a close and it just feels like we just started 2023 and now we've got to start thinking about 2024. So that's what we're gonna be dealing with today, talking about giving you all some ideas for building a successful sales strategy for 2024. And I'm so excited to welcome Dan Markin, our Hello. Vice President of Sales Strategy and Consulting. And many of you who are cl our clients uh, may know Dan and have interacted with him. I can promise you it's going to be an entertaining and engaging session. Welcome, Dan. Well, hey, Michelle, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. We're looking forward to a great, you know, high impact, no pun intended, uh, 60 minutes. So thanks, for everybody, for jumping on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it looks like we did have chat disabled and we've got it up and working. So again, please let us know where you're joining from. And uh, as we go through our content today, um, feel free to enter questions in the Q&A. Let us know your thoughts in chat. Uh, we want to hear from you. So let's talk about our agenda for today. We are going to talk about establishing your strategic objectives for 2024. That's why we're here, right? Uh, we're going to talk about identifying skill gaps, getting managers actively involved in your strategy, effectively leveraging your SKO, your sales kickoff, and planning for continuous learning that empowers your team. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that we have a lot to cover here today. And before we jump in, just a quick shout out to uh, the hard work of our marketing department for kind of putting this together and understanding as we've kind of gone through this material, it's going to be very difficult to get to everything that we'd like to talk about um, in, in 60 minutes. So um, one of our rock stars in marketing, Emily Stradler, had a great idea and a great offer. So if you can hang out until uh, we get done today, we really want to make sure this is worthwhile and of good value to you. So we have an offer for you as we finish today that you might find, again, of value to you. So hang out for that. Thank you, Dan. And um, for that plug, yes, we do have an offer um, coming up at the end of this session. So stay tuned. And again, want to welcome everyone that's joining. We have got folks from North Carolina, where we are based here uh, at the Brooks Group, Canada. We've got folks from Texas all over. So keep it coming. Let us know where you're, uh, um, where you're coming from. All right, let's dig in. All right, the big question, just right off. What is a strategy? Okay, now this might seem a little bit basic that we're starting right from square one, but let's just get everybody on the same page. What is a strategy? What does it mean? So the dictionary definition, it's a long range plan for achieving something or reaching a goal. So Dan, I know you have your thoughts on this. I do. Please you know, <clears throat> yeah, th thank you, Michelle. You know, strategy, the, the term itself is an interesting word concept, however you want to kind of phrase it. Um, you know, I have clients that say to me all the time that they're challenged with creating a strategy or that they're working on their 2024 strategy. And then I'll have them pull me aside and they'll say, Dan, listen, I just need to share with you. I'm not real sure what, what a strategy is or what does it mean? And you know, the kind of, when I think about strategy, I think it's really just as simple as it's the why to what you're endeavoring to do. You know, I remember when my father was in his, his mid 40s, he was diagnosed as a diabetic. And so, you know, he started eating better and exercising and all those kind of things. And he wanted to be healthier. And we kind of left it at that, that, uh, you know, dad was doing these things because he wanted to be healthier. It wasn't until I was probably in my mid 30s and I was having a conversation with him about that time in his life. And I said, dad, why, why did you want to be healthier? And he says, because I want to live longer. And so what happens often in strategies, we stop with the objective or, or the goal. 
which is to be healthier, but really why are you trying to accomplish that goal? So when you think about strategy, think about what you're doing and ask why to avoid. And when you get to that void, that's what your strategy is going to be or what it should be. It's not rocket science. It's really just kind of cause and effect relationships and an educated guess. My father knew that if I ate better and I exercised directionally, I would be healthier. And because I was healthier, I would increase the probability, hopefully, of living longer. So again, just ask yourself, why? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? And we're going to talk in a few minutes about working backwards from there. Awesome. Excellent. So a strategy is just really cause and effect. And I like what you said. It's an educated guess. Right. I mean, you know, we know if we do certain things that we should have a possible outcome. It's not guaranteed. As we all know, there are no certainties in life. Nothing is certain. But what's important about strategy is are we moving directionally towards the goal or the area in which we hope to achieve? So think about things that you do in your life. We've talked about dieting. We've talked about exercise. We've talked about all of those different things. Are we doing things that will directionally move us in a manner and fashion? towards what it is we want to happen. And that's what strategy is. Right, the other so that, is oh. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Michelle. When you think about strategy, the question to ask yourself in business and in life is, are the things that I'm doing, are they helping me get closer to that? Or are they possibly working against me? And a lot we hear uh, our clients talk about time management. And if you can be surgically focused on directional uh, fulfillment, it kind of helps with some of those things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good point. Um, are the things I'm doing working against me or right. for me? And I think we do see a lot of clients who are engaging in activities that are working against them, maybe without even realizing it. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about how you establish your strategic priorities. And you've kind of alluded to this, I think, in talking about working backwards. Um, we have a concept called in impact. Many of you may know it, 3 deep. And you talked about 3 deep in reverse. So what is that? You know, so when you think about three deep, you know, you want to get to the why of the why of why somebody is doing something or really more importantly, the why of will they do something or will they not do that? So when you are engaging in effective questioning techniques such as three deep, you start kind of with the need and you question to the want or to the why. In strategy, you want to do the exact opposite. You want to invert that. You want to start with the why and then work backwards to the priorities that you're going to have to institute to fulfill that why. So in other words, <clears throat> if um, someone was to eat a salad, why would that person eat a salad? Well, because they want to um, lower their cholesterol and they want to lower their cholesterol because the doctor told them that their cholesterol was high. So it's important to think about what it is you're eventually trying to do and then work backwards from there. Instead of in three deep, we start with the doctor told you that your cholesterol is high, going through why is that important to you? It's starting at the end and moving backwards. So you know it's important to think about the inverse of that when creating strategic priorities. Okay, so begin essentially begin with the end in mind. Start yes. with the end and kind of work backwards. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And so for, can you give us an example from um, say a sales related example from a strategy and working backwards? Sure. So it's important to understand, again, we, we start with um, goals such as we want to increase revenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be a strategy, but the question you have to ask yourself, as I said a few minutes ago is why do you want to increase revenue? Well, we want to increase revenue so we can grow. Okay, well, why do we want to grow? We want to grow so we can be the preferred X company of choice in said marketplace. All right, so therefore you would start with, we want to be the preferred provider of X product or service in said marketplace. That's what our strategy is. Then you have to work backwards. So in order to do that, what are the things that we're going to have to do? Part of that might be growth. Part of that might be retention of existing customers. Part of that may be breaking in new channels in terms of marketing or planning. So again, you start with the end in mind, but think big. Think bigger than just growing revenue. Um, it's more about what is it we endeavor to be and why do we want to be that? And then you'll start to get directional focus. You'll be able to institute strategic priorities. But again, it's the working backwards that I think that is so, imper is so, so imperative. So really that big picture, almost like kind of the 
the purpose and then everything else kind of flows from there. And some of that might be a revenue number that's handed to you by your organization. It, it, a- absolutely. And look, that strategy can be individual or it can be organizational or company wide. An individual right. seller may say, you know, my goal is to exceed my revenue target. Okay. Well, why is that important? It's important because I would like to earn as much money as possible. All right. Well, why is that important? Because I'd like to be able to send my ch- child to, you know, college or university, or I might like to take my husband or wife on vacation. But start with what it is you are really endeavoring to. What is it you want and work backwards from there? And that will help give you more clarity. And again, as Michelle said, there is no certainty. These are cause and effect relationships. And what's important is, are the actions that we're taking, are the priorities that we are engaging, are those going to drive us closer to what it is we ultimately want, those big picture or or, or big perspective uh, type ideas, or are they going to work against us, or are they really not important? And so I think it's important to make sure that you're pretty clear eyed about what it is that you're doing in order to work backwards and set those priorities. Okay, so we've had a question. And so while we're talking about strategic priorities, how many strategic priorities should a sales leader have? In your opinion, in your experience, what do you think is the right number? Well, I think you have to have as many priorities. So when I think about a strategy and a priority, the strategy Think about it as the top of a building, for example. And the larger your strategy is, or more robust your strategy is, the larger the top of the building, you're going to need more pillars to support that strategy. So the priorities are those pillars. And it really comes down to really what it is you want to be, how big that strategy might be. And what I would share with you is, you know, fortune favors the bold. And often we get mired in thinking about things we want to be or would like to be personally or professionally. But the second thought is all the reasons why we can't do that. And if nothing changes, nothing changes. So I guess the answer to your question is there is no absolute number of strategic priorities. It's really about how big your strategy is and how many priorities you think that you're going to need to put against this. What I would offer you is it's okay to try more than one strategic priority because look, at worst case, if you're not if you're not measuring those priorities, you don't have them in place, it's hard to know what's working and sometimes what's not. And we're going to talk about the importance of focusing on our strengths in a few minutes, but it helps us to kind of make shifts to our strategy in real time, which is um, very important in terms of uh, getting where we want to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would add to that, just also be aware of your capacity or your team's capacity and the resources and that kind of thing. We're going to talk about that. Um, in just a minute, but and and that may also help you determine what the right number of strategic priorities are, uh, yeah. because I think there's a possibility of kind of um, spreading yourself too thin or spreading your team too thin in trying to achieve, you know, a, a lot of priorities at one time. You know, the, that's a great point, Michelle. One thing I'll add to that is it's important in leadership or just intrinsically as ourselves. The priorities that we set, we make sure we're measuring incremental improvement. You know, I've I've been talking about dieting and exercise. You know, it seems like every month I I say I'm going to lose 20 pounds. And so the first day of the month, I go to the gym and I eat salad and I'm starving. The second day of the month, I go to the gym and I eat salad. Well, by Wednesday, I'm eating chicken wings and French fries because I'm absolutely, again, starving. The point in that is before I can lose 20 pounds, I have to lose one. And before we can grow revenue numbers to X, We've got to get there by why. And so it's important that we measure incremental improvement because we often get hung up on this idea of these huge overarching goals, which is so important and which we should endeavor to do. But we've got to work backwards and we've got to set priorities and milestones that we can effectively measure and manage to see if we're on the right track, the priorities we set are working and make sure that we can continue to gain momentum. Because once we have momentum, we're going to increase the probability that we're going to have further success. Okay, one more question, and then we'll um, we'll move on. But so we had a question submitted. Um, so when you think about working backwards, does that include starting with your quota, reverse engineering to how many transactions you need, average deal size down to how many leads you'll need to get quota? So you know, I think that's looking at it purely from a revenue perspective, or maybe even at the individual seller level. Right. So I think I think when in that example, directionally, that's correct. But what you're getting at there is, again, there's lots of ways you're talking really about measuring leading indicators, which is important. So in that example, to get to a certain revenue number, you're probably going to know that if we close as a percentage this much of, of business, 
we're going to have to have this much pipeline at this closure rate to get to that revenue target. You can also look at it and say, well, to get to that much revenue, we have to have this many meetings and the seller should be conducting this many meetings a month, which all will tie up or tie out to what you had um, just mentioned. The, the, the answer, the caveat that I would make is if you're starting with revenue, ask yourself, why is that important? And if the answer is because my boss or the organization said that it's important, that's fair. That, that's a fair response. But why is it important to you? And when you keep that top of mind, it helps keep us engaged in terms of what our strategy is. Because as we all know, you know, things change and, uh, you know, markets change and what's important. And I've said it now a couple of times, but I think it's important to note you want to make sure you're working directionally towards your strategy and understanding what it is you ultimately want. Revenue targets are a great goal. They're a great objective, but there's something bigger. There's a reason why you want those things. And that will give you broader perspective into, again, directional growth, which I think is paramount um, in achieving our goals. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, kind of intertwined in that is, okay, so you know how many transactions you need. Bigger picture, are those coming from existing customers? Are those coming from new customers? What is it going to take to get to that business? That, that's you right. have to do and differently, right? So it's a little bit more um, strategic above that. Yeah, but like Michelle, you said earlier, you said, look, it's the educated guesses. Right. So what we do when we, we're doing these things, we're making educated guesses and we are endeavoring, we are working to work out these hypotheses of, are these the right priorities? And it's okay sometimes if we uh, miss or get off track, um, but what's important is that we try and we continue to uh, adjust and make in-flight adjustments. But again, they're educated uh, guesses in terms of what will happen. Um, not all things work all the time, and that's okay. Don't become discouraged. Um, what's important is that not always that we are relentless, but that we are relentlessly resilient in pursuit of our strategy. Excellent. All right, so let's talk about how to fulfill your strategic vision. So we've talked about what a strategy is. Um, we've talked about kind of setting those strategic priorities now. Big picture, how to fulfill it. Um, and these are, you know, essentially think of these as pitfalls or the, the opposite of pitfalls and mistakes to avoid. You want well-defined, actionable objectives. It needs to be clearly defined. You need clear communication to your team. If you're a sales leader, everyone needs to have common understanding of what those um, what your strategy, what your priorities are. And then something that Dan, you alluded to playing to your strengths yeah. and addressing gaps. So, you know, obviously we've got to look at, at where the, the holes are in yeah. the strategy and what it's going to take, but you also mentioned playing to strengths. Yeah. And, and I'll talk to that in just a second, but kind of to talk to well-defined actionable objectives and clear communication, you know, uh, I, I've had the privilege to work with, with great clients throughout my career consultatively and, one of the things that I've learned, obviously, as I continue to learn uh, in my role, I, I learned from our special operators in um, uh, the U.S. military. And in this case, it was uh, the United States Navy SEALs. And they said, if you can't tell me what you want me to do in one sentence or less, I'm not doing it because you don't know clearly what it is you want me to do. And that really struck me because how often do we not really communicate clearly and surgically about what we want people to do. And so we, if we can kind of, you know, clear the air, separate, you know, kind of the wheat from the chaff and really understand what do people want to do because people want to be successful, but it's important for them to know what mission clarity is and what it is they have to do. When you think about playing to your strengths, this is a great place to start in terms of strategy. And yet it's overlooked often. Uh, many of us know that we have uh, an interesting to say the least market. I mean, there are indicators in the market that are showing uh, signs of, of of one thing. There are directional indicators that are showing the signs of others. We're feeling that in our business. So what I would offer you is, or encourage you to do is as you sit and you think about your strategy for 2024, look first at where you've had success. What industries, clients, what organizations have you done well with and have great partnerships with? Because those strengths are opportunities for, do, for us to do more of what we do best more often. Look, football team is going to come out, they're going to do what they do best in hopes that they're going to win. They're not going to come out and try to do something they don't do very well and think on this Saturday or Sunday, they're going to do it so well they're going to win. But we make that mistake. We try to get sometimes a little bit, um, you know, for lack of a better term, too fancy and, and, and too glitzy with what we're doing. 
It's blocking and tackling. It's mission clarity. What is it we're supposed to be doing? What do we do well? What organizations and industries have we had success with? And then give ourselves opportunities to leverage those strengths to do the things that we do already well, even better. I mean, I think that's a great point. Um, and I also want to kind of highlight the communication piece of it. And again, I think we're going to talk about that even um, a little bit more, but um, there's a, you know, I like data. And so <laughs> there's some interesting um, research from Gartner um, that says employees are 77% more likely to be high performers when their level of understanding of goals and their connection to the work is higher than when their understanding is low. And so I think that really does speak to getting everybody on the same page. So, you know, as you said, play to strengths, blocking and tackling, don't make it too complicated, and also make sure that everybody on the team understands the strategies, knows the direction and, and where you're rowing. Yeah, and, and I want to make one point here around this, kind of bring this home. You know, societally speaking, we are taught from the time that we're young that we should always work on the things that we don't do very well. You know, we work on the subjects in school when we're young that we don't do very well, and we go to work and we get performance reviews, and we're asked to work on different things. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't try to round out the rough edges, but you are all successful people. You've gotten to where you are, not because of the things you don't do very well. You've gotten there because of the things that you do do well. And it's the same in organizations. So it's important to focus on those things, resist the impulse to do all the things that we've always taught to do. Uh, again, we can round those out, but especially in turbulent times or unforecasted uh, clarity with what we have going on in the market, focus on strengths and really be communicative, surgically and, and objective to, uh, to get where you want to go. Thank you. All right. So when folks registered, we asked, um, what are your strategic priorities for 2024? So um, I took that information, we took it, we looked at it, and here's kind of the, what the group is saying are um, their main strategic priorities. So we had 4% that said improving margins, 3%, um, um, yeah, 4%, 7%, number three, retaining customers and improving customer experience. 38%, big jump now in the numbers, 38% um, said grow new business, some form of growing new uh, business, acquiring new accounts, um, and 39%, the winner, increase revenue and achieve and or achieve plans. So again, 39%. And I know that several of, um, others had some um, different priorities as well. I know um, um, launching a new uh channel distribution channel may have been in there. Some of you are in training. You may have had some learning um, goals as well. This is kind of the, the majority of the group. Any surprises here, Dan? You know, it, it, it's a great list. And, you know, I think about my, you know, formative days as, as a sales leader, that my list look, would look very similar to this. But one thing that, you know, as I was talking earlier about uncertainty in the market, I think when we look at number three, retain customers, improve customer experience. I think this is one that's often overlooked and not that we take our existing customers for granted, but what's really important is that we protect our base. And I share with my clients all the time that our base in turbulent times, most importantly, are gonna be the foundation in which we can hold on to. And so as we endeavor to grow, we always wanna protect the base because we wanna get net new business. As we all know, if we lose 5% of existing customers and great, gain 5% of new, it's it's net neutral. We 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 really haven't haven't gained anything. So, um, and what I see happen is in businesses with people, um, when we become concerned about the future or concerned about achieving plan or revenue targets, the customer aspect what we're seeing here kind of slides down a little bit in favor of increasing revenue. So I just share that with you because um, it is vital in all markets, but most importantly, if we think we're going to get, again, some turbulence in the market, that we protect the base, that we retain our customers, because they will see us through the storm. They will be here with us before, and if we do the right things, they will be with us afterwards. So um, again, I, I think that's important to recognize and, and really should be part of, if it's not already, part of your strategic priority in, in moving into 24, um, because it's it's um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And those provide us some ability to have some certainty with um, you know our existing customers. Yeah, it kind of goes back to um, the question that we had a few minutes ago 
kind of about talking about kind of working backwards from quota, kind of thinking about big picture, where, where is that business going to come from, right? When you're thinking about your transactions, is it retaining customers? I mean, Kurt um, in the chat just said, you know, 77% of this group's priority involves growing the business, right? Whether it's increasing revenue um, across the board or growing new business specifically. So, um, you know, thinking about where that business is going to come from. You know, and Michelle made a great point earlier about making sure we have the right assets and, and the right plans. You know, it's also important not to go to sleep on the idea that a strategic priority needs to be how do we develop our people in order to get to these objectives? I mean, again, things are changing. Things are getting more demanding, more competitive. It's difficult to go out and expect people to do more sometimes without all the tools that they need in, in order to do that. So, uh, look, we all know the most important investment that we make is in our people. Without our people, we can't grow revenue. We can't retain customers and clearly can't improve margins. So, you know, I think it's important. It's also important, again, and I say that there might be some uh, turbulence in, in kind of the markets. People in organizations, people don't leave organizations. People leave people. And so this is also an opportunity for us to create differential in the way we develop, train, and execute with our human assets and our human capital to provide, again, competitive value down the road. Again, leading indicator is more engaged, stronger, more developed people. A lagging indicator will be the metrics that we're looking at on the screen. Yeah. And great point. We're going to be talking a little bit, um, you know, when we talk about identifying gaps, um, what that looks like in terms of developing people. Just want to acknowledge too, um, Drew in chat um, has very high market share. So customer uh, retention and the customer journey is a very high priority. And so I think that's a really important um, kind of connection for those of you that do have high market share, um, or if you're looking even to grow your market share, that customer retention, like keeping your existing customers happy is going to be such an important part um, of, you know, of that strategy. It, it, and it's also important, and market share is a very, very important indicator in terms of health in the marketplace. You know, I had a client and, and uh, her perspective was that her sellers should sell more every year. Well, the interesting thing was when you looked at share, when you looked at the share of the business they had, they were doing a great job selling, but you get to a, a point where of diminishing returns, where if you own so much market share, there's always so much available share to go out and get. And so the benefit of that is your strategic priorities may change. And that's a good thing. You may be able to get into different segments, different markets, as long as you're protecting those uh, existing customers. Like Drew said, it gives us a lot of opportunity to have more dexterity. And that's when we can really grow, is when we have a strong base of business that we can catapult from. So share is important. And it's actually the most important part of, of what we're doing because the more of that we capture, obviously, the less there is for the competition to uh, to have. Excellent. All right. So we have we've talked about strategy. We've talked about setting strategic priorities. Let's um, let's drill down a little bit further. So then the next step, you let's say you've assigned or decided what those strategic priorities are going to be. They are clearly communicated. They're um, they're measurable, you know, the next step is going to be aligning those, your objectives to the strategy. So this is really the taking that next step backwards, right? How are we going to get there? Right. And some things to consider as you are thinking through the objectives, right? How you're going to uh, accomplish your strategy. You need to think about your customer trends, right? How are your customers buying? What are their product and service preferences? If you're like Drew and you've got very high market share um, and the budgets are not really growing, like, you know, take that into consideration. You need to think about internal and external factors. Are there market factors at play in your industry? Are there regulatory issues? Are there internal dynamics going on, right? You know, some organizations may still have supply chain issues, that kind of thing. Resources. What resources do you have available? And I think this may also come in um, with the, the question around how many strategic priorities. What kind of budget do you have to allocate towards these objectives? If new technology needs to be purchased, if training needs to be purchased, do you have the personnel to support it? 
And then KPIs and incentives. So how are you going to measure your objectives, your progress towards your objectives, and do your changes or your strategy, is that going to impact your sales team's compensation? So one mistake I think, Dan, you and I will see is that organizations, when we're working with organizations, maybe they want to shift from account management to um, more of a new business growth prospecting mm -hmm. um, mindset, right? Um, activity. Mm -hmm. Their incentives are not designed to drive new business growth. There's sure. no differentiation. So you want to make sure that as you're thinking through your strategy, if you're asking your sales team to do something different, that your incentives line up. Absolutely. You know, this is this is really important because, you know, what I see, and look, I was guilty of it too as a sales leader, we would get new revenue thresholds, we get new targets, and the targets would be what they would be. And we really wouldn't spend enough time really... Um, from a tactical perspective, understanding how we were going to accomplish these things. Often we just think we're just going to do more of what we're already doing. Well, that might work, but what I would share with you is, is that that also becomes exhausting. And so then what we're doing is we're working hard and there's nothing wrong with hard work, but there's also the applicability of working smart and understanding where there are opportunities to do different things. The other thing that I know I was guilty of was not really kind of putting pen to paper in terms of what we were going to do day in and day out to accomplish our strategy. And this was important, not from a holding other individuals accountable per se, but the point I made earlier, it's important to recognize is what you're doing working. If we're going out and we believe, again, they're cause and effect relationships. If we think or believe that if we get X amount of meetings per week, per month, per quarter, this should drive to a certain pipeline uh, number. Well, maybe we're doing all of those things, but we're not getting the pipeline number. Okay, there's two types of problems, a good problem and a bad problem. A good problem is one that you know that you have, so you can put efforts and resources against it to fix it. A bad problem is one that you don't know about because you can't do anything about it. In this case, we know that we have a problem. This isn't working. Okay, great. How do we shift? What do we need to do? Why isn't it working? Don't continue to do the same things and expect a different result. I mean, we've all heard that um, expression over time. So this is really important because there's no other way to know if our leading indicators are affecting the lagging indicators unless we put them on paper, we talk about them. And this is also important because as a sales leader, what I often see is when a seller gets behind on their goal and their number, the sales leader often wants to jump in, which is which is good, which is admirable. We want to help people succeed, but there's nothing to look at. It's all done retrospectively. What have you done? What, well, what's already been done has already been done. And so we're always looking back last quarter, last month. What's important is we look forward and what things are we going to do that are going to impact or we believe are going to impact the future. And man, I'll tell you what's really powerful is when we hit on them and we find things that are impacting the future, more of it, more often, better results. Again, playing to our strengths. And um, again, Michelle made the point about resources and budgets and understanding the incentive programs. And, you know, I often hear from, um, you know, our, our clients and our prospects, you know, I don't feel like our folks are really hungry to get out there and sell or this, or they're not really engaged as I'd like for them to be. And the question I ask them is, why would they be? And you have to ask yourself that question. Um, you know, demographics are changing in terms of workforce. We've got to be nimble. We've got to have... Uh, dexterity and how we motivate and incent people to do the different things. And again, we can we cannot do that. Um, and we may be right for not doing that. But I always ask folks, would you rather be right or would you rather win? I'd rather win. So it's again, <laughs> it's important to be thinking about what we might need to do because at the end of the day, I think we'd all rather win. It's it's nice if we're right too and we can win, but I think right kind of uh takes a backseat to winning. <laughs> well you gotta um you got some agreement from Kurt, um, who said, well said. So uh, thank you, Kurt, for that. And openly addressing gaps in strategy, so comment from Drew, is key. And it can be difficult for leaders. Yes. So, you know, this can be a process, any of this, that maybe is not comfortable or might be outside of um, many sales leaders' kind of comfort zone or skill set. Yeah, you know... You know, problems rarely, if ever, get better on their own. 
And I can tell you the quicker that you address a problem and you deal with it. And I think it's also important to understand the reason that we don't deal with things sometimes is because there's a fear of doing so in, in all aspects of our life. And what's important to understand about fear is fear is simply one thing and one thing only for all of us. It's the unknown. The things that you're worried about today are causing, uh, you know, take up mind space and capacity in your mind right now. The things that, you know, maybe causing some level of discomfort or may rise to a level of anxiety that are simply because they're unknowns. The things that you thought about a year ago, you probably can't remember because from that time and from then until now, those unknowns have become known and you've dealt with them. So while it might be uncomfortable and we have to address, address gaps, what we want to do is make the unknowns known. And the way that we do that is by attacking them. Because once we know, then we can deal. And it's the not knowing that holds us back and makes us apprehensive. And that is very important in terms of gaining um, you know, competitive perspective over the competition. Those who wait and see are less likely to be the first ones to cross the finish line. And so when things are kind of tenuous and stressful, we want to make the unknowns known. We want to lean in. And that's really when we want to think about pouring on more effort in terms of the things that we're talking about so we can be uh, as successful as we'd like to be moving forward. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's there's value in the exercise. So getting this out there and, again, doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be, um, you know, extremely detailed, but going through that process, there's, you know, enlightenment in terms of where the gaps are and <clears throat> kind of helps, again, how do you move forward? You know, our, our CEO, Spencer Wixom, I don't believe that he he invented this, but I've heard them say this several times and it really stuck with me. He says, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. And so again, work to try, do the best you can. Doesn't necessarily have to be perfect, but you're moving again, as I talked about earlier, directionally towards where you want to go. And so again, it's a continuous learning, you know, perfect is the enemy of good and fortune favors the bold. All right, so now we've uh, we've got our objectives, and then and of course the one that you love, Dan, focus on your strengths. We said we'd come back to it. We're back to it. So let's talk about this. So you're you know as you're building your strategy and your objectives, the tendency is to um, to focus on gaps, and we're going to get to that. But let's talk about strengths. How do they go about doing that? Look, I think you know I always. Um when I was managing sellers, I always thought about this, you know, it's no different than really managing a high performing team. You want to put aces in their places. You want to make sure you're providing people the best opportunity to do the things that they do well. And so I think you have to do a couple of things. I think one, you have to do an inventory and really have um, some meaningful dialogue with your folks and what they enjoy doing, because the things that we enjoy doing, we're going to be good at. The things that we don't enjoy doing, we're probably not going to be too good at it. So first, where, where do your players want to play? Where, where, where do they feel uh, they can have the most value? If that's in an account management perspective versus more of a hunting role or, or a new business perspective, have those dialogues. But also look at it by industry. Look at it by segment. Look at it by customer. And so, again, where do you want to grow? And then where are you doing well in that segment industry? Um, that, that you can provide more resources. And the other thing about it is when you're where you're doing well, you have good stories to tell. You have something that people want to learn about and you have the confidence going into these situations. And confidence is key in terms of not only uh, identifying and, and, and strengthening our strengths, but also in terms of growth. Um, think about this way. You know, we often sell differently depending on where we are uh, in relation to our sales quota or our number. And so when we're more confident because we're out in front of things, we have less concern or less urgency about getting things done. When you want to grow, you have to be confident. You have to be confident in what you're doing. You're going to have confidence if you go to the places that you're doing well and you do more of that, again, to the extent that you can. But also, where do your, where do your players want to play? And, and that's overlooked often. And so not all people are going to be great in all situations, but there are people that can be great in all situations. It's incumbent upon a leader to make sure we have our aces in our places and we're growing in the right manner and fashion. So for that 38% of our participants out here that wanted to grow their new business, is that something like looking at your ideal client profile or looking at clients that um, are your best and how do you replicate that 
in different markets yeah, so, or yes yeah. so 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 you want to grow okay we want to grow now we, as we've talked about we start with the end of mind why do we want to grow we can answer that question that's going to be unique to every other every other person okay we want to grow how are we going to grow the first part place you should go to is where you're already experiencing success so that could be let's pick you know industries i mean name them they're gonna there's a myriad of of them out there could be construction infrastructure healthcare whatever industries you are experiencing uh, positive outcomes in, that's where you should start first. Not about all the share that we don't have in markets that we don't touch, that we don't have experience in. That is a much harder or heavier lift. Not that we can't get there, but it goes back to the conversation we were having earlier with Drew, is that grow as much share as you can, get a, a strong, solid base of existing customers, and that gives you the catapult then to go in to different industries. Own what you're good at first before you start trying to be all things to all people. And that's a common mistake that we make in terms of sales strategy. We need to, as Michelle said, block and tackle, do the things we do very well, be very clear-eyed about who our, who our customers are, the industries that we work in, and dominate those industries. And from there, we grab that share, then we can diversify and do things as part of maybe the 2025 strategic planning process. So again, where are you doing well? How do we leverage uh, our resources to do better in where we're doing? And that's the best part to start in terms of strategy and even in terms of growth, because um, where there's opportunity and where there's motivation are pretty, uh, pretty big indicators of the opportunity for success. All right. Well said. All right. Let's talk about identifying the gaps. Um, you know, as you're looking at your strategy and your objectives, think about what your team needs to do differently to achieve those objectives. So yes, you wanna focus on strengths, but the reality is we also have to um, look at our team and our capabilities um, and figure out where, where those um, potential opportunities for development are. So evaluate your sales role requirements. We've seen coming out of COVID, um, buyers have changed, how we sell has changed. Um, take a look at what's required for success in your industry with your customers and has that changed have those requirements changed and then objectively assess your team's current capabilities right so look at the i i like data and so um you know get the objective data on what your team does well strengths and where those opportunities are um you know assess them uh, look at do they have the right skill sets, the right capabilities, the right mindset for what you need them to do, and then how do you how do you get them there? You know, it, it, Michelle brings up a good point, and, and if you know Michelle, you know that she says she likes data. Like is a is a is a probably a, is it term, I guess, Michelle, for, <laughs> for your your uh, desire for data, but. Um, th this is really important as, as we talk about the gaps, but we, we talk about putting their aces, aces in our places. But for many of you that use our assessments and have used our tools, this is a great time to kind of brush them off and to kind of look at them again and say, you know what, are we setting people up in the right roles based on not necessarily their behaviors, but their motivational profile and kind of where they're going to succeed. The other thing that's important as you hire and you grow, as you gain more share, the complexion of your business may change. You may need to move more from a uh, hunter uh, to more of a farmer. And are we allocating the right resources? To put a hunter in a farming environment and expect that person to be as wildly successful as an innate uh, farmer would be is not going to be as good as if you find the farmer and put them in that role transversely with hunter-farmer. So, again, this is really important is we evaluate where we're at. We make strategic decisions based on where we want to go. And then we make sure that we do kind of look at the gaps and we, uh, you know, access current capabilities. Do we have the engine to get to where we need to go? And often that's not a matter of replacing the entire engine. It's more subtle changes as new oil, better valves, things that we can do to increase the efficiency and productivity of that engine. Yeah, good point. And I think um, we often think of training as a component of that sales strategy. And I would just encourage you all to, again, look at your teams and their capabilities as part of that decision before making assumptions on what is needed in terms of development, um, whether development is needed or not needed. 
really kind of take a big picture look at your team. Yeah, it's a great point. And the other thing that I think that, again, I know I was guilty of, and I learned this the hard way, but it was a, a good lesson to learn is invite your people into the solution matrix or the solution phase of what we're trying to do. You know, I, I, I can tell you that uh, every time I had to kind of hand out revenue goals or revenue targets to my sales team, no one ever walked away smiling and happy. It was always kind of a, a contentious you know, discussion about what the numbers should be, so forth and so on. When, when eventually I moved to saying, hey, ladies and gentlemen, here is the goal that we have to accomplish as a team. I'm going to leave the room and I'm going to let all of you decide how we're going to get there. Um, you know, people are incrementally and empirically more committed to things that they sign up for, that they agree to. And so bring your team together, talk about the, the kind of the gaps, talk about what we have to accomplish and bring them to the solution. How do we do this? What do we need to do? And uh, again, it, it's, it's, it's a very important point that, Mich that Michelle makes is that um, collaboration and bringing people to the table to solve problems will definitely increase the likelihood of commitment and most importantly, their ability and your ability to get the results that you'd like. Yeah, a couple of questions that have come in um, and some comments. So um, Nelly, I think sales professionals need to have a gap plan if they're not achieving their target every quarter. What are your what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, what what, what was the question I missed? I... So it's um, a comment that sales professionals need to have a gap plan. So we plan to address those gaps if they're not achieving their target at every quarter. So I think what's important is it goes back to your leading indicator. So if you have a gap, mm -hmm. the question becomes is why is there a gap? Well, if we don't have the activities and we have, don't have the, um, you know, the, 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 the activities in place to drive our results, it's hard to say why. It just becomes a guess at that point in time. So what's, what's imperative is, yes, you have to have a plan, but the plan should be something that you're not doing retroactively. In other words, you don't want to start working the plan when you're behind. And that's often what we do. So we'll say, well, we're not meeting our numbers, so we need to go out and increase this, this, this number of meetings. Well, sure, we want to do that too. But the question is, why are we there in the first place? And if we can see trends earlier, what you're hoping for is that you see the deviation um, before the gap occurs. So if it, in, in a month, for example, it's about the most finite measurement that we use in sales. If you're not getting the, the return or you're not making the sales that you would like in week or in month, the question becomes is why? What am I doing? What am I not doing? And you need to change that so you can get the desired results. Um, I agree with you 100% that we have to have plans, but the imperative is, do we have the plan in place to begin with, rather than being retrospective after we're already behind. Anytime you're behind, it's always hard to play catch up, as we all know. So as soon as you start to see that splinter from where you are and where you want to be, that's when you want to jump all over it. But you can't know that unless you're measuring this, you know, weekly, monthly, as along with the activities that you're engaged in to hopefully get that number. So that's just basically essentially that's coaching, right? Yes. So some regular coaching kind of keeps you ahead of that rather than than behind. Absolutely. Um, so one more question, does uh, does a gap lead to a PIP? So if a performance improvement plan, if you can't close the gap? It's a great question. Um, you, you know, I think anytime that, first of all, there should never be any surprises with regards to PIPs. Um, when you come to that point in time, all cultures, all organizations are different in terms of the latitude that people have in terms of a, a performance perspective. Um, what I know is that honesty is one of the most underrated attributes that we have from a communication perspective. And because sometimes we're uncomfortable, because we're human beings, as Michelle talked about earlier, we don't have those conversations that we have to have. And so I think really I share with my clients from a management perspective, as a leader, you're really kind of one thing and one thing only. You're the arbitrator between the standard and the behavior. And so we are going to get in life what we settle for. So if we're not happy with what we have, it's because we settled for it. In turn, people want to do well. It's our, door, it's our job as leaders to open up doors for them to walk through them. And so I think it's really a, a will-skill conversation that you're going to have to have one-off. I don't think there's a 
uh, you know, a broad brush answer that a gap leads to a pip. I think that it's more imperative that you understand why things are happening. You're honest about the conversations. You don't let it fester. You don't allow yourself to become aggravated or upset about it. Make those unknowns known. Why is there a gap? What are we doing about it? And be clear about what the standard is because you're the arbitrator between the standard and the performance and what you're going to do moving forward. In short, I think an honest, good, candid conversation kind of heals a lot of these things in most cases. Yeah, yeah, well said. All right, so the next stage in our plan or in building our, our strategic plan is engaging managers. So involving them in creating the solution and equipping them to lead change, because essentially if you're rolling out strategic priorities, if it's something different than what you've already done, then you've got change management, um, you know, a, a change management component. So Dan, I know you've got um, an interesting story around involving um, involving your managers. Why don't you share that? Because I think it illustrates this point really well. Look, you know, when you when you when you engage your managers, what's important to understand is that when you are trying to come up with a solution or drive strategy, it's not necessarily the idea or the strategy that is the problem. It's adoption of the of the strategy or the plan. Um, and so, to Michelle's point, when you can bring people in, and I talked about this on on the prior slide. When you're creating a solution, really what you want to do, there are three points on a change um, or a solution matrix. You have those that are gonna be adamantly against the solution and that are never gonna get on board with it. You are gonna have people that are gonna be 100% for it and on board with it. And then you're gonna have the third spot, third spot on this plane, which is kind of in the middle. What we typically do when we're trying to engage people, we are engaging typically people that are resistant to the change or the, the, the solution. And what I would encourage you to do is think about how many things in your life that you feel absolutely adamant about is someone going to change your mind on? It's probably not going to happen. What's imperative is that we focus on the people that are in the middle because we want to get more people on the fore side of the solution, on the fore side of the strategy, because that's how change management works. And we have to change all of the time. And we have to change not just annually, probably biannually, sometimes quarterly. And it's our job to make sure we're articulating strategy, but we're involving people, but also giving them the doors to walk through and focusing on those people that may not be completely certain, but helping them see the vision and the light of why we're doing what we're doing. Again, remember, you can have the best idea in the world, but if the, adopt, the idea is not adopted by the people in your organization, it falls flat. It's not the idea, it's the adoption of the idea. So engage people, bring them to the center. Yeah, love that. It's the adoption. It's not the idea, it's the adoption. Mm -hmm. All right. So next, leverage your sales kickoff. Um, and so again, going back to what we talked about earlier, clearly communicating strategy. Use this opportunity for those of you who are bringing your teams together. I know a lot of organizations are coming back together in person. Um, using that opportunity to clearly communicate strategy, incorporate training, some kind of skills training, if, that's, if you've determined that from you know, assessing your gaps and use that to uh, generate enthusiasm, energy, really connect to the purpose. Yeah, I think you said it all there, Michelle. I think you kind of wrapped that up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we do have a um, a guide to planning a successful kickoff for anybody that's looking to um, getting started on their planning or, or looking for some best practices. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out. And then um, plan for continuous learning. So, you know, again, you've you've got your strategy if you're if you're leveraging your kickoff, especially if you're doing training, but really any kind of train of, of change, we need to be thinking about the continuous learning aspect of it. This is not a one-time um, event. Your strategy is something that's gonna have to last all year. Um, so looking at things like digital reinforcement um, or coaching from managers. So another piece of data, organizations see an average of 8% increase in sales performance from their core performers when supported by be better coaching from their managers. And that's a stat from, from Gartner. So again, these are the things that are going to be kind of the linchpin of, of making your strategy successful and, and sustaining it across the year. Look, I mean, we all try to swing a tennis racket differently, swing a golf club differently, and we may try it, but it's that reinforcement. It's the constant practice and the muscle memory. And so it is important to continue to put focus on learning in a myriad of ways because people learn differently. So 
again, I, I would just the echo Michelle sentiments, encourage people, encourage everyone to make sure that we are continually coaching. Um, even our best performers want to be coached. And we have some data out there. Michelle probably could pull it up, but I won't put her on the spot. It talks about how even long-term or more tenured employees even value coaching sometimes more than our than our newer people. So it, it is vastly important to do this. Yeah. And again, if you're asking your team to do something different, it is change. And you've got to be able to support that. All right. So Dan alluded to the fact that we had an offer at the beginning of, uh, of our session, of our webinar. So for those of you that are still here, um, you know, we are not able to dig in and answer every single question or dig into detail on your um, strategic plans. But we are offering you the opportunity um, for a small group forum with Dan and I to talk about your plans, get feedback, um, give you some advice, and that will be on Tuesday, October 17th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. If you are interested, want to save your seat, there's the QR code. You can scan it. Dan, what are your yeah, thoughts look, here? I mean, look, th th this, this is really important. And, and again, it was Emily, you know, again, kudos to her that really came up with this idea. Because, look, you, you know, as your partner, we understand that these are, these are challenging times and, and you know, in this in this medium, we hope we shared some information with you that was a value. But really, as you know, if you partnered with us, the, the genesis of good learning is the back and forth dialogue that we can have together. And uh, while I know that I don't know everything, but Michelle knows more than I do. Clearly, it's important for us to be able to kind of talk with you and, and understand kind of what what your um, what you're, you're going up against. And because you took the time to, to join today, we know it's important to you, and it's important to us. And so. If you'd like to have a little bit more dialogue, we are more than happy to engage that. Obviously, no cost uh, to you because um, we want to we want to be there for uh, for you. Well, and I think there's value, you know, surely in in talking to to you and I, Dan. But there's also value Absolutely. in learning from your peers. And so, um, you know, having a, a group of leaders on to kind of bounce ideas off of. We've done these in the past. They're they're extremely um, valuable. We learn from you all as well. So again, it's an opportunity to bring your plan, bring bring your issue, and we'll talk through it. Um, and so we certainly hope you can join us. Again, um, scan the QR code to, to register Tuesday, October 17th. So two weeks, I think, from now, yeah. from one to two. You know, the, the great thing about these is when we do them, you know, one of the big aha moments people have is they come in and say, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only person right, that's having right. this issue, right? Like, and so uh, the synergy, as Michelle said, from learning from each other, is um, is is what's of value. So we'd love to see it and be able to provide any continued value that we can. Excellent. Okay, so a few key takeaways here on the slide. Q and A. I know we're we're coming up close on the on the top of the hour. We'll stick around and answer questions if um, if anyone else has any. Um, you know, again, begin with the end in mind, define that end state and move backwards, work backwards, um, communicate your objectives, play to your strengths, um, assess your gaps, involve your managers, make the most of your SKO and incorporate continuous learning for your team and join us for a strategy forum on October 17th. That's the one that's not listed here. We really would like to have you. Um, I want to go back, Dan, there was a, a comment from earlier when we were talking about um, assessing gaps. So Drew says that one of his biggest challenges is managing his team's relationships with their respective distributor reps, especially since um, he has high performers. And I know you work a lot with organizations um, that sell through channel and distribution. Mm -hmm. Any any thoughts, ideas for for Drew? Yeah, you know, Drew. I mean, li listen, I, I would be happy to talk with you offline, understand the issue e even a little bit more. But um, you know, relationship. We 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 use the word uh, pretty broadly in all facets of our life. Um, you know, a relationship is one's ability to provide another what they want and what they need when they want it and when they need it. That's really what a relationship comes down to because. When you fail to do that, over time, there is no more relationship. And so depending on what the nature of the issue is, um, 
you know, with the, your distribution network or actually different distributors, the, the, there's a lot of things to, to, to look at. And I'll kind of answer it two ways. If if the, the relationship is is maybe you think one that is is too close and too uh, congenial, then I think, you know, we you have to talk about that, but you have to be clear about why you think that's in, a possible concern and what you might like to see change and why you'd like to see, see change. And it's got to have some business application to it um, as well. If it's the other way where maybe we're not, um, we don't have as strong relationships as we would like, or we can't get in there um, and, and get ride alongs with them or whatever they may be, we got to ask the same questions. Why is this happening? And what are we going to do to kind of kind of change it? But again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. If I had a little bit more insight, I'd probably give you a little bit better advice, but Again, what I would what I would ask uh, or, or offer you is ask the questions, understand what it is that you really want. Ask your seller why is this happening, and then why you would like for it to change, and why that's important. And again, invite them to um, to the um, to the solution table as well. Excellent, thank you. And uh, take a look uh, or be on the lookout for some additional resources that we'll be providing um, our sales coaching techniques to boost revenue. We talked about coaching, um, you know, not only in terms of continuous learning, but also in enabling your managers, making sure that they can coach through change. And as I mentioned before, um, the white paper on um, your guide to planning a successful sales kickoff. And Dan, I believe that this is all the questions that we have. It has been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Listen, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everybody for, for joining. Um, we, we are signing off, but we're never too far away. Feel free to reach out to us if you need anything at all. Uh, we'd like the opportunity to uh, chat further. Thank you, Michelle, for being such a great host. And, and as always, uh, a great job to you. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you all, uh, as many of you as possible, on October 17th for our small group forum. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us.